The uh, title of my sermon tonight is It's Not About the Grapes. It's kind of a strange title, but uh, and we'll get to what that means, but I first want to kind of study this story of Naboth, because I think this is one of those stories that really nobody ever preaches on. I know I've never heard a, a sermon on Naboth specifically, never heard anybody preach it, and I think there's a reason why, but let's go to uh, verse 1. Let's read the first four, verses, first four verses again. It says, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or, if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me, that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. So we're introduced to a character named Naboth. He has this vineyard which is next to the king Ahab. He, he wants this vineyard. And when you think about the modern day, this is what would be called eminent domain. I don't know if anybody's ever heard this term before, but it's basically a term where it just means the government can at their will decide that they just want to take any of your goods or possessions and then... You know, to make it fair, they just pay you what's fair market value for it or just kind of give you some kind of price for the goods that they take. But, you know, even in America today, the government could just walk up to your house and say, hey, we're going to take your house. Here's the money that we think your house is worth, and then they can just take it. And it's kind of this same idea that Ahab's trying to come on in and saying, look, I just want your goods. I'll either give you another vineyard or I'll give you some kind of money. It's kind of interesting how most everything we have in the world today, you could find a story in the Bible that tells you what that was like. But we see, what does Naboth say? He says, the Lord forbid it me. So why was it that Naboth is saying he's not going to give him the vineyard? It was because the Lord had forbid him. But we see that there's this temptation brought by King Ahab to do what? To violate God's word. To go against God's word because he's saying, the Lord said I shouldn't give my, my vineyard to you. That would be against his commandments. So he's being tempted by Ahab with what? With money or with a vineyard. Now it doesn't necessarily say this, but he may have given him a really good price. Or he may have given him even a better vineyard. We don't know exactly, but we see there was a temptation. There was pressure given on him by the king to sell his goods. And you know, there's always going to be a temptation in our lives to violate God's word even from somebody of, of, of great power, maybe. We see that there was a great, you know, uh, a man, Ahab, the king of Israel. I mean, this guy is asking him to do something. Most of the time, people want to comply with authority. They want to comply with the, the main ruler or whoever's in charge. You wouldn't want to really go against them if they really want something from you. But we see, hey, God's word's more important to me than what you're telling me or whatever you could offer me or any kind of goods. Amen. Go to Matthew chapter 4. You know, the thing that I like about Naboth, which I think is really interesting, is he pictures Jesus Christ in so many different ways. If you read this story, it's interesting how Naboth is really a picture of Jesus Christ in a lot of different ways. Now, obviously, when we look at Old Testament references, they're not always going to be a perfect example of Jesus Christ or everything that he went through. But we can see a lot of similarities that Jesus went through, the same with Naboth. So if you look at Matthew 4, let's start there in verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So, in the same way that Naboth was tempted, we see Jesus Christ Himself is tempted. Someone comes along and is trying to tempt Jesus Christ to violate God's Word. And what does Jesus Christ respond with? He says, you know what, you've got to live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And I think that's a good way to word it because when we think of this commandment that Naboth's going to observe, it's not really one of those that most people would know or most people would think of or one of the maybe greatest commandments. I mean, you could maybe categorize it one of the lesser commandments if you were going to, you know, kind of categorize the different commandments. But we see Naboth thought it was important to follow all God's commandments too. He says, look, I'm not going to sell my inheritance 
God commanded me, I'm going to live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And we see his attitude there implied through the story. So we see that he was tempted kind of in the same way. Christ was tempted in the same way that Naboth was, or vice versa. So let's go back to Numbers 36. Let's see if what Naboth said was true. Because not necessarily just because he said that is it true that God commanded him to do that. But let's go back in the law and see if Naboth is justified in what he said. Is what he said accurate that God was saying, hey, you're not supposed to be giving your inheritance to this guy. You're not supposed to be selling it. Numbers 36, look at verse 5. And Moses commanded the children of Israel according to the word of the Lord, saying, The tribe of the sons of Joseph hath said well. This is the thing which the Lord doth command concerning the daughters of Zelophehad, saying, Let them marry to whom they think best. Only to the family of the tribe of their father shall they marry. So shall not the inheritance of the children of Israel remove from tribe to tribe. For every one of the children of Israel shall keep himself to the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. And every daughter that possesseth an inheritance in any tribe of the children of Israel shall be wife unto one of the family of the tribe of her father that the children of Israel may enjoy every man the inheritance of his fathers. Neither shall the inheritance remove from one tribe to another tribe. But every one of the tribes of the children of Israel shall keep himself to his own inheritance. Even as the Lord commanded Moses, so did the daughters of Zelophehad. So we see here in this that God is saying, look, the inheritance that was given unto the twelve tribes of the children of Israel was not to ever be traded hands between the tribes. They were always supposed to keep that within the tribe and to be passed down. We see uh, there's another place where it said it would be passed down into the sons. And if there was no son, then it would be passed down into the daughters. And if there was no daughters, then it would be passed down to the next of kin. And we see there was this there was type of order that God had given for the inheritance that it wasn't just supposed to be lightly just discarded or lightly given away. Because when people would just start giving away their inheritance and selling it, maybe they might be like the prodigal son and just go spoil all the goods, and then the next generation has nothing to inherit. They can't. They don't have any goods, and then they're sold into slavery, and then they're just constantly in this bondage of being poor and poor and poor. God didn't want that. God wanted each generation to have the inheritance that was set out for them, for them to continually inherit the land that their fathers had given, so they'd always have some type of portion. They'd always have some type of inheritance physically. That was God's plan. That's why we even see with the year of Jubilee. It was always supposed to be even reset all the way to the very beginning so that even if there was any kind of shift, it was always going to be reset. Go to Joshua chapter 15, if you would. Joshua 15. Now, it's interesting because when you read about Naboth, it says Naboth the Jezreelite. Naboth the Jezreelite. It says that many times. So if it was not even lawful for him to sell his inheritance unto Ahab, I'm going to suspect that he's probably not of the same tribe. But if we look in Joshua chapter 15, look at verse 20. It says, This is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Judah, according to their families. Now then it gives a long list of the lineage of the family of Judah. But look at down, skip down to verse 56, if you would. It says, And Jezreel, and Jotham, and Zenoah. So we see those that were of Jezreel, those that are Jezreelites, are of what? The tribe of Judah. So we know that Naboth was of the tribe of Judah. So for him to be within God's commandments, within God's law, he was not to sell his you know, land or his inheritance to someone that was not of the tribe of Judah. Now it gets kind of hairy here. Go to 1 Kings chapter 16. When we, when we look at the lineage of Ahab, he's a very unique character because... His father, his father's name is Amri. And now Amri just comes on the scene just out of nowhere. I mean, this guy does not, uh, we don't see his family lineage. We don't see his tree. And 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse 23, the Bible says, And the thirty and first year of Asa, king of Judah, began Amri to reign over Israel, twelve years. Six seers reigned he in Terzah. And he bought the hill Samaria of Shemer for two talents of silver and built on the hill and called the name of the city which he built after the name of Shemer, owner of the hill, Samaria. So the only re the reason we even have Samaria is because this guy named Omri, he bought some kind of land from somebody and he called the hill Samaria. So that's where we even get, you know, the Samaritans and the land of Samaria is from this guy named Omri. The interesting thing is Omri... He just comes on the scene. We don't know who his father is. We don't know what tribe he is. But just by the implication that he buys this land, 
It seems that he probably didn't own it. It wasn't his inheritance. He's not, you know, this isn't part of his portion. He's just buying this land. And then Omri gives birth unto Ahab, who we have the king Ahab coming. So I can't say dogmatically that Ahab's not of the king of Judah, but it seems implied from the story that, that he's not from the kingdom of Judah. And that would give us good reason. Naboth would probably know that. That's why he's saying, look, it's not lawful for me to sell my land unto you. I can't, I can't sell this land unto you. Because he was following God's commandments, his clear commandment that he shouldn't be giving this to another tribe. I believe that means Naboth probably knew, hey, this guy's not of my tribe. But, you know, he's coming around trying to buy, to buy the land, just like his father did Amri, right? Because Amri is buying land. Now, maybe it's possible Amri is buying that according to God's word. I would suspect, you know, based on his life, he probably wasn't following the commands of God. He worked wickedness in the sight of God. Those of the house of Amri are very wicked in the Bible. It stands to reason he probably wasn't following that commandment if he wasn't following any of the other ones. But let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 21. So I think that's just kind of an interesting, you know, thing that Naboth is saying. He's trying to follow God's word. And I, I would give him the benefit of the doubt. I would say he probably knew that Ahab was not of the king, that was not of the family or the tribes of Judah, and that's why he's not selling it unto him. He's trying to follow God's law, he's trying to follow God's word. We see the second way that he's like Christ. If we go to uh, verse 9, it says, And she wrote talking about Jezebel. And she wrote in letters saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people, and set two men, sons of Belial, before him, to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carried him out and stoned him that he may die. So we see here, Naboth was going to endure some persecution for following God's word. And the Bible says, Yea, and all that will of God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you're tempted to follow God's word, if there's pressure on you to follow God's word, and you decide to follow God's word, there's going to also become persecution. There's going to be affliction. There's going to be some kind of negative consequence that comes with following God's word in many ways from a carnal aspect, from those that are opposition of God, opposition of the things of God, those that want to persecute God. And we see even with Naboth it's not any different. When he decides to follow God's command, he probably understood there might be some bad ramifications. I mean, this is Ahab. This is the king. He wants my land. He has the most wicked wife. That we, one of the most wicked wives that you can find in the Bible. I mean, there might be something coming down, you know, the pike for me because of this. We see, of course, it happens. Jezebel, she wants to set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him. Now, that just stands a good reason. Why should you even have all the murderers and the pedophiles and the sodomites you know, destroyed out of the land. Why should they be executed? So then you don't have people that are just willingly going to bear false witness against somebody and kill them. Because you know what? The sons of Belial are willing to kill people. They want to kill people. We don't even see in this story necessarily that they were given any money. They were promised anything. They were threatened. She's just like, just find two sons of Belial. They were willing to lie and kill somebody and put them to death. How wicked. How wicked to just decide, I don't even know this person, and I'm just going to lie under oath so that they would be killed. But that's when we see the wickedness of the sons of Belial, and they're always like that. It says in Romans 1 that they're full of all wickedness, they're full of murder. We see in Judges chapter 19 that they abuse the woman all night until they leave her dead. We see that the sons of Belial, they want to kill, they want to murder. And sometimes people get the idea of like, are they running around with machine guns and, you know, machetes and wanting to just kill people? No, I think it's more like this story. They're willing to go to law and lie about you. They're willing to get somebody involved to go out and kill you. They're willing to, you know, use deceit and trickery and all this, this vain stuff to be able to kill people. We see these sons of Belial, they don't want to get their hands dirty necessarily, but they'll stir up, stand up and tell any kind of lie because they're full of all, you know, wickedness and evil and unrighteousness. They're willing to lie in a row. They're willing to kill you. And we see that's not any different today. That's not any different from the sons of Belial today. That's why nations should get these people out of their country. That's why they should put them to death. They're worthy of death. The kind of person that's willing to just lie under oath and kill somebody is worthy of death. But let's go to Matthew 26. We see the same thing happen with Jesus Christ. We see there's so many different parallels here with Naboth that are the exact same with what happened with Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew 26, verse 60. But found none, yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false 
witnesses. Look at verse 61. And said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And I, a priest, arose and said to him, Answers thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Now what did they falsely accuse Jesus Christ of? Of blasphemy. Of blaspheming God. Now Jesus Christ was of course not blaspheming God because He is the Son of Man. He is the Son of God. He was testifying to the truth. And He's saying, look, you're going to see Me at the right hand of the Father and coming in clouds with great glory. He wasn't blaspheming, but that's what they falsely accused Him of. What was one of the things they falsely accused Naboth of? of blaspheming God. That was the first accusation that they brought upon Naboth, saying, this guy is blaspheming God. But we know it was a false witness. The second thing they, they had uh, persecuted him for was saying that he had blasphemed the king. Go be with the, the book of John. Go to the book of John. You see, the same thing happened with Jesus Christ. And I think this is just a picture. Throughout the Bible, we see a lot of people that kind of live the life that Naboth did or have the ending that Naboth did. And I think it's just signifying and, and trying to prepare people to understand what Jesus Christ was going to do. Because there are a lot of them have this false idea that Jesus Christ, when He came the first time, He was going to set up some earthly kingdom and rule and take back the kingdom from the Romans and they were going to set up this heavenly kingdom on earth. But that wasn't what Jesus Christ came to do. He came to die for sinners. He came to give His life unto those. And so we see there's a lot of examples in the Bible where people are being martyred for the Word of God, where they're dying. We see that Abraham and Isaac is the perfect example, I think, of, of the Father giving the Son to, to die for the sins of the world. We see in John chapter 19, look at verse 7. It says, then, it says the Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he hath made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was, more the, he was the more afraid. And went again to the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then said Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and I have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour, and he said, saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with them, away with them, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him, therefore, unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. So we see Jesus Christ. What was another accusation that they brought against Jesus Christ? Look at verse 12. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. What was one of the accusations they were bringing against Jesus? That he was going against the king. That he was going against Caesar. That he was trying to say, he's king and not this king Caesar. He's not paying respect and honor unto Caesar. Sounds just like Naboth. They're saying he's blaspheming God and the king. Perfect examples and pictures of what would happen to Jesus Christ. Being falsely accused by the Jews and these other false witnesses. Let's go back to our story, 1 King chapter 21. So again, not necessarily is all persecution in the Christian life going to be death. I mean, there's other persecution that we can have in our life. But we see a lot of times the persecution can be a threat of death or it could even lead to death. We see this is the case for Naboth. This is the case for Jesus Christ. They died for, for the Word of God, for what they testified of. Jesus Christ testified that He was the Son of God, make, and they said He's making Himself God, so they crucified Him. We see that Naboth's not willing to sell the vineyard, and what happens? Abot have to kill, wants to kill him. Let's go back at 1 Kings 21, verse 11. And the men of the city, even the elders and the nobles who were in the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them. And it is written, and as it is written in the letters which she had sent unto them. 
They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Then they said to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 27, if you would. So we see it ends up coming to fruition. The plan that Jezebel had devised against Naboth is a success. I mean, exactly to the words that she wrote in the letter. They set Naboth on high. They blaspheme. They say that he blasphemed God and the king. They falsely lie about him. And then he's put to death. We see there at the end, though, it says they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Another picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew 27, verse 31. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of the skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that they might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. So they say that they led him away. They led him away to be crucified. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ was, you know, led outside of the city to be, to be killed. Now, he wasn't stoned, so it wasn't exactly a perfect example of what happened to him, but he was led away, and then he died. That was the end of the story for Naboth and Jesus Christ, at least in the flesh, right? Obviously, they both live on past the flesh. But it reminds me of this parable. Go to Matthew 21 now. Let's go back a couple. But we see that sometimes for the Christian life, even by following the Word of God, it ends in death. And you say, why is the story of Naboth not preached you know, all the time and over and over? It's because of positive preaching only. It's because pastors don't want to get up and preach the story of Naboth because it's negative. Because it's not a fun story to hear. Hey, here's a guy who did everything right and he died at the end. He was lied about and he was taken out of the city and he was stoned to death. And you go, man, that's, that's not a very fun story. That's not a great story to think about. But that's a more realistic picture that the Bible paints in a lot of ways. There's a lot of characters that this paints the picture of. But I think this whole story it really reminds me of uh, Matthew chapter 21. Let's look at verse 33. Let's read this parable. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent unto other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to power. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard these parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Isn't this an interesting story? When we think of Naboth, when we think of Jesus Christ, and then we go back to this parable, man, there's a lot of stuff in here that's pretty similar, isn't it? We see that there's a husbandman. Now, I think in this story, if we were going to kind of relate it to Naboth for just a second, right? The husbandman could be who? It could be, the, it could be God. It could be the Father, right? He's given us all things to enjoy. He's entrusted Naboth with what? The vineyard. And we see he's the servant. He can be, he can be resemblant of the servant. And then what do they do? They kill the servants. They kill the son. So they can do what? Seize on the inheritance. Just like Jezebel. Just like Ahab. They want to kill him so they can seize on his inheritance. 
But there's a lot more there, isn't there? This is a picture of what the Jews were like in their entire you know, course of history. We see God's constantly sending them prophets, constantly sending them servants, constantly doing what? They're preaching the Word of God. And how do they respond? By killing them, by stoning them, by crucifying the Son of God. We see they didn't receive Him well. And we see when these prophets are preaching the Word of God, what's their ultimate end? It's death, isn't it? A gruesome death in some cases, right? Very, very difficult you know, thing to even realize or to think about or, or to, to ponder on. They caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him, we see. And what is the husbandman going to do to them, though? I mean, he's going to miserably destroy them. We see what happens to Jezebel and Ahab. They're miserably destroyed. Even the dogs lick up their blood is what the Bible teaches about those people. And, of course, the sons of Belial, they're going to burn in hell for all of eternity because they're children of the, of the Satan. We see in this, this parable that uh, there's a lot of resemblances of what the Bible teaches throughout, I think. Of this, of this story of, you know, what is the Christian life really about? What is the, the ultimate, you know, end? What is the meaning of the parable? What is the meaning of, you know, Naboth's story? Now, obviously, you can draw a lot of meanings out of this parable, but I think we can see one of the reflections of being a Christian. One of the things that happens is sometimes you might be martyred to death. Sometimes your end may not be as glorious as you want it. We see many of Christ's servants died a very sad death. One that none of us would ever, you know, really in a, in a carnal way want to happen. I mean, nobody wants to be drug out of the city and just pelted with stones until you die. Nobody wants to be crucified. Nobody wants to be beaten to death. Nobody wants to be lied about and have your life ended, of course. But we see, what was, the, what was the reason that Naboth did it? Was it because he just loved his vineyard so much? Was it because he just loved those grapes? No, it wasn't about the grapes. He wanted to follow God's word, wasn't it? Look at Matthew 23. You skip over just a couple more chapters. Now, when we think of the people in the Bible, uh, there's plenty of examples that we could think of, stories of victory. We could think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are thrown in the fiery furnace and they're delivered by the Lord Jesus, you know, by the, the angel, right? Which was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ being in the fire with them. We think of Daniel in the lion's den, being thrown in the lion's den. And we have, you know, the lions are you know, going to possibly eat him and kill him and destroy him, and he's delivered. We see that the angel closes the mouth of the lions. We think of David and Goliath, the story of this great giant. Who could go against him in the flesh? We see David cast the stone and hits him. I mean, these are stories that everybody knows. These are stories that everybody's heard of. Why? Because there's victory. But you know what? There's even more stories in the Bible of people that that's not how it ended for them. That it didn't end in a great way. It didn't end with something good happening. Think about the very beginning. Let's look at Matthew 23. Look at verse 35. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. So we see Jesus Christ is rebuking the Pharisees and he's saying, look, you know, these guys that are righteous are constantly being slain. Think of, the, think of the very beginning. We have Cain and Abel. Now, is Abel doing anything worthy of death? Is Abel just being this really wicked guy and going against God's commandments and doing that which is wrong? No. He's, he's doing the righteous sacrifice. He's following God's commandments. He's trying to live for God. And then what happens? The wicked one comes and slays him. He kills him. Murdered. I mean, what a horrible way to go. What a horrible way to die. As we think through the Bible, it's the same story for so many Christians. Over and over. Go to Hebrews 11 if you would. In 1 John chapter 3, the Bible says, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. So the Bible lifts up Abel. It says Abel was a righteous guy. He was doing righteous things. He had, he had uh, obtained favor because he had a righteous sacrifice. He had sacrificed by faith, right? He, was right? he had imputed righteousness from the Lord upon him. And he was slain. He was killed by that wicked one, by Cain. In the world today, it's not any different. The wicked want to slay the righteous. The wicked want to kill God's servants. The wicked want to slay those that would stand for the word of God. 
They hate the Word of God. They don't want anything to do with the Word of God. They don't want to come into the light unless their deeds should be reproved. They hate it so much that they just have to get rid of it. They want to kill the person that's testifying of their wickedness, the Word of God that shines the light on their darkness. They want to get away from it so much that they're willing to spill blood. And we see Cain. He's envious of his brother. He's evil. He doesn't like that his brother's righteous. He doesn't like that he's doing that which is right. The Bible says in Romans 1 that they hold the truth in unrighteousness. They know that what you're doing is right. They know if you're following God's commandments that you're in favor with God, that God's pleased with you, and they don't like it because they're not. Because they, because their works are evil. Because they can see, hey, I, this guy is doing that which is right. I don't like him. I want to murder him. I want to kill him. And we see this in the story over and over and over in the Bible. Look at Hebrews 11, verse 4. It says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. So again, just emphasizing the verses in the Bible that talk about Abel, that he was righteous, and Cain killed him. Look at, uh, skip down to verse 32. So this is kind of like what people call the hall of faith. Where we see all these great men in the Bible, all these great women in the Bible, those that live for God. Look at verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. This is where most churches stop their preaching. They say, look at all the victories that people got in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at all the victories you can get through God. If you serve God, it'll always be good for you. Everything blessing. I mean, your best life now. I mean, you're just going to have victory through Jesus Christ. It's even in this life. Not the, the life next. That's really what that song says. I mean, the songs of victory through Jesus is the fact that we'll go to heaven. That we can overcome death and hell. That we can be, uh, have eternal life through Jesus Christ. Not that you're going to necessarily always victory in this life. Not that you're always going to win some kind of battle in this life. And obviously we don't wrestle against flesh and blood today in the New Testament. But we wrestle against spiritual wickedness, right? But are you always going to win? Are you always going to win that physical battle? Are you always going to have that, that physical victory? Is it always going to be roses? Is everything great going to happen for you? Now, I believe the mindset of a Christian should be one to have hope on the Lord, to be trusting in the Lord and saying, hey, I know He can deliver me. I know He's powerful. I know I can, you know, rot victory. But that may not be the case. But you know what? I'm going to trust in the Lord anyways. I'm going to stay steadfast in His Word. Let's look at the, the rest of this, this chapter. It says in verse 35, Women received their dead raised to life, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they may obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So of course, I think a lot of people would say, hey, I want to be on the winning team. Hey, I want to win the battle. Hey, I want God to, you know, help me defeat Goliath and defeat, you know, the lion's den and go through the fiery furnace. But when it comes to being able to go through the rest of this stuff, the uh, torture, the not accepting deliverance, cruel mockings, bonds and imprisonment, stone, sawn asunder, this is when people start getting offended. By and by they're offended and they want to, you know, decide, hey, I like God's word, but not that much. Hey, I thought we were going to get victory. I thought nothing bad would ever happen to me if I followed the word of God. No, we see there's a lot of times that there's going to be great persecution, great affliction, great distress, great things that are very wicked and evil could come upon God's people even though they're in the will of God. That could be the will of God for their life. Right. Yeah. You say, wow, that doesn't sound very exciting. But I like verse 35 because it... It gives, it gives a little bit of hope 
in the midst of all this, you know, evil. It says that they may, might obtain a better resurrection. Saying, look, hey, if you go through such, you know, persecution, such affliction, you, if you ended your life in such a horrible way, hey, you're going to have a better resurrection. And you know, what's 60, 70, 80 years in the light of eternity? What is that in the light of, you know, the eternal glory that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ? If you truly have your heart set on things above, on the glory that comes from God, on pleasing the Father, on the thing that, you know, is going to carry with you into eternity, you're not going to shy away from whatever could happen in this life of some type of cruel, you know, cruel uh, mocking or scourging. In fact, and I don't even think this is the wrong attitude, you might actually desire it. If you really understood what you get for going through the persecution and tribulation and the afflictions, you may say, hey, I don't even think that would be a bad way to go. Why? Because in light of eternity, you'd rather have the eternal glory and the rewards that comes from heaven. So even if you were to go through these persecutions, it can strengthen you in your mind to say, hey, you know what? I hope God delivers me because then I can keep preaching the gospel because then I can still live my life. But if I don't, maybe I'll just get a better resurrection. Maybe I'll just get that extra crown. I'll just have that better. I'll shine brighter in heaven. Yeah. So you see, you can have the courage and the boldness to stand for the word of God no matter what affliction comes upon you. Because as we look at the days approaching, it looks like Jesus Christ could come sooner than later. It seems that the day is approaching fast. We see that the world's getting more wicked as the days go on. And we need to set a reality in our minds and in the hearts of the people that look, Bad things could happen to us. You could be persecuted with very hard trials of death, of imprisonment, of, of being beaten, of things very terrible that you would think, I never really want to go through that in the flesh. But you see, hey, that could give me even more rewards in heaven. That could give me more glory to God. I want to look at a few more examples. Let's keep going in Hebrews chapter 12, though. Let's keep finishing this thought. Because we've been kind of building on the hall of faith all these great victories, and then we kind of see some, you know, uh, in the in the flesh, some, you know, not victories, you know, some, some persecution, affliction. Look at Hebrews 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted in the blood, striving against sin. Now what I'm, I like the way this is worded, because I want to caveat this. I don't think it's wrong the desire to be persecuted, or, you know, or, or have joy for being persecuted, or going through some some kind of tribulation for the word of God. But we see even Jesus Christ, he despised the shame. Right. The, meaning he endured the afflictions, right? He endured the cross, meaning he wasn't enjoying the pain. He wasn't enjoying getting beaten. He wasn't enjoying being mocked. He didn't enjoy the fact that people were, you know, cursing him and he's going through these afflictions for the word of God. It wasn't a physical pleasure unto him. It was persecution. It was affliction. But he knew, hey, I need to do this for, a, for, for an end goal. He had an end goal and purpose. What? So that the world could be saved. So that all those that would believe on him could have everlasting life. So that we could, you know, be resurrected with him. He did that. He endured that so that we could have that, right? He endured it so he could save the world. So he could die for the sins of the world. Just like us, we may have to endure some type of affliction or persecution. And we can have the hope in the future. Hey, I could obtain a better resurrection. The word of God could go forth even more freely. So, we should never shy away from persecution and tribulation if we have eternal mindset. If we understand the, the purposes and, and, and uh, goals that the Lord Jesus Christ has set before us, because if you're in God's will, I don't believe that He's going to bring upon persecution and tribulation in vain. It will be either you know for your betterment of reward in heaven, to, to further the gospel, to bring more honor and glory unto Him, because we see this guy was faithful unto death. This guy believes the Word of God so much he wants to follow God's word so much that even at the threat of death, he's still going to stay with it. He's still going to stick with the word of God. Let's go to Acts chapter 7. Let's look at a couple more people. But I think it's important to get 
you know, a, a full scale view of all these people that suffered great affliction, great persecution in the Bible. Look at Acts chapter 7, verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. We see Stephen, a man full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost, appointed unto the business of the Lord. He preaches this great sermon. He preaches the Word of God to the Jews, trying to get them saved, trying to get them to believe on Jesus Christ. And then he's stoned to death. Wow, what a way to go. What a way to end your life. Not a way that many people would say, that sounds great. That sounds like a good way to go. But we see, even at the, at the point of him dying, he still has mercy on the people saying, Lord, lay not this sin under their charge. What a mindset. What He must have the eternal vision. He must be thinking of things above, not of things in the earth. Because if you're thinking of only things on the earth, you could never have this mindset. You could never desire you know, to want to be stoned. You may have decided to hold back some of his preaching so as not to be stoned. Because as he starts out just giving the history of the Jews, he's not really offending anybody. He's not really you know, upsetting them by talking about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the fathers and all the history. It's when he gets to the end and he starts preaching about Jesus Christ and how they rejected him. And then they, get, then they turn on him. Then they turn their ears and stop their feet. They charge after him. They take him out of the city. They stone him, right? We see in uh, Mark chapter 6, I'll read for you. It says, And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in prison. Who's it talking about? John the Baptist, who's considered one of the greatest men among, born among women, according to Jesus Christ, right? The greatest man. How did he end his life? By being beheaded in prison. What a horrible way to go. We think of great men like Stephen, stoned to death. We think of John the Baptist, his head cut off. We think of the Lord Jesus Christ, killed at age 30, crucified. We think of Naboth, what? Just taken out and stoned. There's so many people in the Bible, I don't even have time, just like Hebrew says. <laughs> the time would fail me to tell of all of those that end such a horrible death. Go to Revelation uh, chapter 20, if you would. Revelation 20. I'll read for you in Acts 12. It says, now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. We see the false religion. They loved it when a God's man was killed. They loved it when James was killed. And the false religions today, they want nothing more than the, the men of God to be killed, to be put to death. False religion is one of your enemies. The Jews, the Jews' religion is the enemy of the gospel. He's the enemy of Christ. We see that James, I mean, one of the disciples, killed with the sword. What a horrible way to go. We see he's even seeking after Peter, trying to kill him too. Look at Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So there's going to be a great multitude of people that are beheaded for Jesus Christ. Not just John the Baptist. Even other people that would be beheaded for Jesus Christ, but they rule and reign with them. But we see that they're given this great mention in the Bible. And what were they doing? They were standing for the word of God. They were going to take the mark of the beast, which is contrary to Scripture, which is contrary to the word of God. They're standing for the word of God, and then they're beheaded. We see John the Baptist preaching the word of God, and he's beheaded. We see Stephen preaching Jesus Christ, and he's stoned to death. We see Naboth standing for the word of God. He's drugged out and killed. Jesus Christ preaching the word of God. Of course, everything comes out of his mouth is the word of God, right? And then he's what? Crucified. We see in John chapter 21, verse 18, Verily, verily, I send you, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest where thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. When Jesus Christ was speaking to Peter, he gives him kind of this you know, vague interpretation of when he's going to die. He says, Look, you're going to be carried where you don't want to go. Speaking of what death, just meaning he's not going to die a death that he wants to die. 
He's not going to die in some, you know, in old age. He's going to be drug out somewhere he doesn't want to go, signifying what death. Sounds a lot like, you know, Jesus Christ. What? Drug out and crucified. We see Naboth drug out of the city in stone. We see, you know, Paul drug out in stone. I think that's, you know, probably a, an idea of what maybe have happened to Peter. I'm not going to get dogmatic. The Bible gives us a vague description. But we see even Peter probably died a gruesome death. Died a death that he didn't want to die. We see all these great men of God, all these people throughout the Bible, Jesus Christ preaching in the parable, all these servants, all these prophets dying, Zacharias, Abel, all through the Old Testament, men and women being sawn asunder, being killed, being sawn asunder. That sounds horrible for the Word of God. Then we have all the stories of victory, right? Go to Daniel chapter 3. So we talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being a story of victory. But I like their attitude. And I think this is the attitude that we should always have is the attitude of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The Bible says in James 1, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So we even saw before when it's talking about uh, John chapter 21, when Peter would die, it would glorify God. So one way, if you die for the Word of God, it brings honor and glory unto the Lord Jesus Christ. It gives honor and glory unto the Word of God, saying, this is worthy for me to die. There's a lot of ways you could die. I mean, you could die in vanity. You see, people today, they'll be bodyguards. They'll go out and serve in the military. They'll die for their country. They'll die for some man, perhaps. Why wouldn't you want to die for the Word of God? That's way better than just dying for some guy. Or just dying for some country that's wicked as hell, like our country. I mean, what a horrible way to die. There's so many ways to die. Why not die for the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. That would be a good idea to get in our head. Say, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to live the, the life that God's going to give me, and I want to not compromise on His Word, and I'll die the die that He's appointed unto me. Look at Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now, even if they had died in the fiery furnace, I like their attitude. They're saying, look, we know God's able to deliver us. Our God is all-powerful. He's in control. You wouldn't have power unless it had been given you from heaven. But you know what? If, he, if he's going to let us burn, we're going to burn, but we're not going to go against the Word of God. Amen. We're not going to serve the gods that you set up for us. We're not going to bow down and worship them. I'm not going to go against God's Word. I'm going to serve it faithfully, and I'm going to put my hands in Him. And in his hand. I'm going to put my life in His hands. I'm going to entrust my soul and my life into His hands. Not just for salvation, but my physical flesh. I have a lot more. Let's go to... Uh, Acts chapter 5 for the interest of time. But I like their attitude. We see that you get glory unto God when you die. We see in James chapter 1 that it says you would be given the crown of life. We see that you could obtain a better resurrection. It's not to die in vain. There's a lot of reward and blessing and good that can come out of suffering for Jesus Christ. The Bible says in, uh, in, in Revelation 2.10, I'll read for you. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that he may be tried. And he shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Jesus Christ is saying, look, y'all are going to be persecuted with the threat of death, and you're going to be put to death. But be faithful unto death. And guess what? I'll give you a crown of life. I mean, what a, what a promise of God. But look, is he promising best life now? Is he promising all the blessings in this life? No, he's saying, I want you to die for me, but guess what? I'll give you a crown of life when you get up here in heaven. To, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And you're not going to ever, you know, be like, man, I shouldn't have done it. <laughs> I, should, I should have followed God's word. No, you actually suffer loss if you decide not to follow God's word when you get to heaven. When you stand in the judgment seat of Christ and he's rewarding you according to your works. He's like, hey, I had adorned these works for you. I had adorned you to be faithful unto death and inherit all these great rewards and the crown of life. But you didn't do it. Now you're going to suffer loss because you didn't follow God's commandments. See, it's a hard thing to do. This isn't an easy thing. This isn't the first step of Christianity. This is a thing that we should work up to. But if we're eternally minded, 
If we're thinking on the things of God, we say, you know what? God's Word's always going to be the precedent for me. I'm always going to follow it. I'm going to be faithful unto death. We see that you can have the boldness to stand for the Word of God. Even at the threat of death, or even at the threat of dignities, or, or these powers coming unto you and saying, are you really going to follow God's Word? Yes. Absolutely. I know God's able to deliver me, but even if He won't, I want to follow God's Word. Because it's always going to be the best thing for me. Go if you would. Do I have you go to Acts chapter 5? Go to Acts chapter 5 if I didn't, if I didn't have you turn there. I'll read for you a couple other places. It says in uh, Acts, uh, Romans chapter 8, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or soul? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Look, you can't be separated from the love of Christ. Tribulation, persecution. And he says that we're counted, for, all, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. Christ's servants are constantly killed for the word of God. It's a, it's a more common occurrence than those that are wrought in the victory. If you really look at the guys standing for the Word of God, many times they're killed and slain for the Word of God. You see, there is a lot of those, those stories in the Bible. In Acts chapter 5, verse 40, the Bible says, And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. We see the early disciples there commanded, hey, don't preach in Jesus Christ's name. And they did it anyways, and then they were beaten. And you know what? They, I don't believe they enjoyed the beating. Okay? Just like Christ endured the cross, we see that he despised the shame. Nobody enjoys getting physically beaten. That's horrible. But after the fact, guess what? They were able to rejoice. They're like, we were counted worthy to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ allowed us to go through tribulation and persecution for His name's sake. That must mean I'm doing something right. That must mean I'm going out and preaching the gospel. I'm doing what He said. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You say, oh, I'm not getting ever persecuted. Well, are you living godly? Are you following all those commandments? Are you going out and preaching the gospel with boldness? Because if you go out and preach the gospel with boldness, undoubtedly you will suffer persecution. You will suffer tribulation. Now, I'm not saying it's always the exact same. It's not like if you go soul winning, you're going to get drug out and stoned to death every single time or something like that. But be sure, if you decide, hey, I'm going to follow God's commandments, the enemy's going to come for you. And he's going to tempt you. And then guess what? When you don't you know, falter in that temptation, there's going to be persecution. And it could even lead unto death. But we see it with Naboth. It wasn't about the grapes. He didn't decide to say, I can't sell you my vineyard because he just loved the grapes of his vineyard. He didn't do it because of the wine. He didn't do it because he just really wanted that piece of land. He did it because of the word of God. He wasn't going to violate God's word. That's why he decided to stand on the word of God. That's why he didn't violate the commandments. We see when you're rooted and grounded and say, I want to follow God's word, the circumstances don't really matter. You may not have a, the vineyard be your temptation. It could be something else, right? But we see that it's for the Word of God that he, that he stayed faithful. 1 Corinthians 15, it says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? You know, for a Christian, you can actually not fear death. You can not fear the physical death, which is a hard thing in the carnal mind to, to experience. It's a hard thing for us to really wrap our minds around because most of us want to live... You know, a long life. We want to have a family. We want to have kids. We want to see a lot of things. We want to travel the world. We want to get as many people saved as we can. We want to do a lot of things. We want to eat. We want to eat a steak dinner again. I mean, I'm looking forward to the next time I get to do something like that, right? But you cannot fear death if you say, "Hey, I'm going to follow God's commandments. I'm going to follow His word. I'm going to try and be faithful to His word." And if He appoints me into death, especially through persecution. Oh, where's that sting? I'm just going to get even more rewards in heaven. If I go through the tribulation, now I can rejoice even more. I bet a bed, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you'd asked them, do you want to be thrown in a fiery furnace? They'd have been like, no. That sounds horrible. But after the fact, couldn't you have great rejoicing? 
Be like, man, I was thrown in the fiery furnace and not even singed a bit. The Lord Jesus Christ delivered me. What a great testimony. What a great thing to go through and rejoice. We see the, the, the apostles, they're threatened to, to, be, to be killed. We see Peter's put in prison to be killed. And they endure that. They go through that. So if you survive, now you have a great testimony. You can rejoice. If you don't survive through the persecution, what happens? You're going to get a crown of righteousness. You're going to get a crown of life. You're going to have great rewards from the come from God the Father. It's a win-win. But you know, it's always a lose when you decide, hey, I'm not going to follow God's word. Hey, I'm going to go ahead and sell the vineyard. Hey, you know what? He's, he's the king. I might as well just do what he said. I'll leave you in this last verse. Philippians 1, verse 21. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I will not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to part and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. In the, in the Christian mind, to be with Christ is better. To depart is far better. To be with Jesus Christ is better. We should not fear death. We should, we should rejoice to follow God's word. Now, of course, if you get out of God's will, if you're sinning, if you're living a wicked life, you better fear death, because the, for the ways of sin is death. But, for those that are following God's word, for those that are trying to be faithful unto his word, you cannot fear death. You can say, hey, I'm going to obtain a better resurrection. I want to be like Naboth. That's why I think we should, when we think of Naboth, we should think of the, the uh, endurance that he had. The desire he had to follow God's word, and how he was faithful unto death. How so many people in the Bible are faithful unto death. I think this is something that as a Christian we should ponder on and get settled in our heart. Because if you don't have it settled in your heart now, how are you going to do it when the real temptation comes? When the real struggle comes? There's a lot of men, even Peter, I believe he was sincere when he said that he would lay down his life for Christ. Yeah. But guess what? When the temptation came, he wasn't. He wasn't ready in his heart. And I think it's realistic to believe in our lifetime, the way our world is headed, that there could be some rough times. There could be some rough persecution. And we should remit, we should I hope that this sermon or the story of God's word, Naboth, will come into your mind and say, hey, you know what? If Naboth can die for not selling his inheritance, how much more can I for the word of God, for the commandments that he's given me? Let's let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, so much for your word. Thank you so much for your example that you gave us, and the example of so other some so many other men. Thank you so much that even if we are persecuted or go through tribulation for your name's sake, that you reward us for that, that you're there with us, and that even if we were to die a physical death, that we would depart and be with you forever and we could rule and reign with you. Thank you so much for being a loving and merciful God. I pray that every one of us would have the faith and the boldness to just put our life in your hands, that we would be faithful unto death if it ever came to that, and that we could continue to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.